It should almost go without saying that the internet is absolutely a huge topic, and we really can't cover nearly as much about the internet as one would like, but we are going to cover what, again, is typically taught in an intro class or BCIS course, or if you're just looking at this to learn more about computers, this should help you get your feet wet. So let's talk about what is the internet. We have a couple of definitions. We have one from uh, Webster, which is an electronic communication network that connects computer networks and organizational computer facilities around the world. Coming from Wikipedia, we have the internet is a global system of interconnected computer networks that use the standard internet protocol suite, TCP IP, to link several billion devices worldwide. The takeaway points here, the key points about the internet is that it's a WAN, a wide area network. We talked about that in the last video. It is also unseen in the history of humankind anywhere in this planet. This is a humongous public network of computers and devices. We have one of the most amazing ways to share information and ideas that has ever been born. One of the things that I've enjoyed doing over my career as an educator is I've taught both computer technology as well as life science. I've taught biology and anatomy and physiology. And it's always interesting when we start talking about the early history of life sciences, for example, the idea of bacteria, cell theory, uh, germ theory, all of these different ideas and how long they took from inception to acceptance, how long it took from somebody coming up with an idea to writing a paper to maybe a follow-up. Sometimes we were looking at three years, five years, ten years. Sometimes it took an entire lifetime before an idea took root. The internet is so amazing because let's say you have a discovery. Let's say that you're in a research facility somewhere and you discover something. You discover something groundbreaking. You can have that idea catch fire before dinner time. If you release that information for breakfast by dinner, the entire world can know what you're talking about. This is both good and bad, obviously. It's good because great ideas can get out there. Mankind can be bettered by great thoughts and thinking. But at the same time, there's some stuff that gets out there that eh, kind of doesn't help mankind out at all. Maybe puts us down a couple of pegs on the evolutionary chart. So the key here, though, is that we have a way to communicate, share ideas, express ourselves, unlike anything before. A case in point, what I do now, where I develop curriculum and videos, was impossible to do, I would say, even 10 years ago, even though the technology was there, the ability for everybody to access it as much as they can wasn't there. So we definitely are living in some very interesting times where knowledge is just exploding. Let's talk a little bit about what brought us here. We had something called ARPA, which was the Advanced Research Project Agency. It was formed back in 1958. And what's kind of cool about this was this was a reaction. Uh, the, Rus the Russians launched Sputnik. They launched the first satellite and it freaked out the United States. Here was you know, Russia, here was the Soviet Union sending up a satellite into space, and here we were still feet planted on the ground. And there was a real fear that the Soviet Union would become dominant in the space race and just be able to you know, shoot down death rays from outer space and destroy uh, the United States. And so this agency was formed in order to speed up progress, in order to make sure we stayed on the cutting edge. And if you remember history class, you'll probably remember something called the space race. This was part of that whole deal. So the Advanced Research Project Agency was formed in 1958, again, partially in response to the launch of Sputnik. October 1969, two nodes were connected, thus creating what we call ARPANET. This was a, I would say, great grandfather to what the internet is now. So nodes were at UCLA, and SRI, Stanford Research Institute, ARPANET, like I said, was the ancestor of what would become eventually the Internet. Now, you might have heard that the Internet was formed in order to uh, respond if there was a nuclear war. That's kind of urban legend, uh, although there were studies to see what would happen if there was total global you know, destruction, what would happen with the Internet. 
But the internet, as we just said, was not developed in order to, you know, if there was a nuclear war to still be there so we could watch cat videos. It was there, again, was kind of there because of war reasons, because of the Sputnik thing, but anyways, moving on. December 1974, the first use of the term internet was put forth in a publication. August 1991, CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, published, uh, publicized the World Wide Web Project. The web was invented by Tim Berners-Lee in 1989. We're going to take a separate look just at the World Wide Web alone. That's a whole different conversation, which we'll include in uh, lesson, uh, lesson four here. Uh, Mosaic, by the way, was the very first popular graphic web browser. So that's kind of a basic history of the Internet. Now, if you go online, you can find a much more detailed history of the Internet, some more geeky, more engineering-ish than others. But this kind of gives us an idea of where it came from. Uh, some of us old timers still remember the internet before we had World Wide Web, web browsers. So how do you get on this interweb? How do you get on the super highway of information? You have to go through something called an internet service provider, otherwise known as an ISP. This is how you get online. This is a business that allows their users access to the internet. So you just don't plug in directly into the internet. You have to go through a company, which would be an ISP. Some of the more popular ISPs are, and this is by no means listing of my favorite ISPs, this is just some of the bigger ISPs that are out there. You have Comcast, you have Time Warner Cable. This could change, I would say, maybe within this year because they were looking at merging, there's some issues here. So it could very well be Comcast, Time Warner Cable. We don't know, but we have Com Comcast, Time Warner Cable. You have Verizon, you have AT&T, you have Sprint, CenturyLink, and Cox Cable. When you choose an ISP, how do you pick the ISP for you? You want to get on this internet thing and you want to know how to get there. I would say well, usually what determines how you're getting online is availability. Sadly, in some areas, you really don't have a lot of choices who you go with. Uh, so number one choice would be availability. Who is available in your area? Now that we live back in Humble, we have pretty much one company we can go through. We have uh, Comcast. When we were living in North Virginia, we were using Cox Cable. So availability determines for most people who you're going to use. The next one is cost. So let's say you do have choices. How much do you want to pay for it? Even if you're stuck with one company, cost can also factor in because you're going, okay, how much, how many services do I want? They bundle them together. They do different promotional deals. I tell you, it gets very complicated very fast when you're looking at bundle deals and promotions and how long they last and what kind of contract they have you sign, you need to be very careful as far as this goes, or you could wind up paying a lot more money than you thought you did. Another thing might be download and upload speeds. You, what you're looking for here is how fast you can download information. So for example, you want to file on the internet, you want to watch this video, that's a download speed. This video, as I was making it, I have to upload it. I have to upload it to the internet. Download speeds are always faster then your upload speed. So downloads faster, uploads are slower. Something to be cautious about as a consumer is guaranteed minimum speeds. Now, every internet service provider does this. They'll say blazing fast speeds of XXX megabits per second and blah, 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 blah. That's not necessarily the speed you're going to get. In fact, the more people on your network, the more people who are buying into that ISP in your area might slow down your speed over time. So, for example, if you are on a cable backbone in the area, you, the more people in your neighborhood who sign up for a deal, the slower your connection speed is going to be. What you want to do is you want to look in the fine print at the minimum guaranteed speeds. So even though they might say 20 down, you might never see 20 down. But if the minimum guaranteed speed is 10, you better be sure you're getting 10 on a download. So look at those minimum speeds. Also, look at customer service. Now, unfortunately, when you've combined all this together, sometimes you got to go with a company you really don't want to go with. And their customer service is horrible. But they're the only game in town and uh, as I've made references to South Park before, South Park has an entire episode about the cable company on this one. So I'll let you watch that on your own time. Uh, not appropriate for kids, by the way, but how many South Parks are. 
So, how do you know how fast you're going? That's the big question. And you can find out pretty simple. There are two sites that you can check out. You have Speed Test as well as SpeedTestComcast.net. These are free services where they will test your upload speed and your download speed. In the next video, we're going to take a look at technologies of the internet. And yes, you will be a geek if you're not one already after that series next.